host Dee Mason, welcome back to the top 10 worst episodes of Thomas and Friends season 11. In a change from the videos that I normally do with worst episode lists, I normally go over the same background information, like what year was filmed, who was directed by, who was produced by, the narrators, etc, etc. But now, I'm just going to say that if you want information about all those things, refer back to my top 10 best episodes video where I go over it. Season 11, for me, is a good season of Thomas and Friends, but not without its failings. I was still able to put a top 10 worst list together, but I will say it was a little bit more difficult for me this time. The other series, it's been pretty straightforward to put a worst list together, and the best list has been the struggle. This time it was the other way around. I'm really glad of that. It does feel like the writers have finally found their stride with what they're looking for with this season, and I think it's quite appropriate that the great discovery comes after this season because they really did find their stride at this point. So these are my top 10 worst episodes from Thomas and Friends season 11. Once again, these are all my personal opinions and your list will be different than mine. It's the one thing that makes the Thomas fandom so unique. And let me know in the comments what your worst episodes are. All I ask is that you be respectful and above all, enjoy the video. Okay, let's dive in. Number 10, Henry's Lucky Day. Written by Paul Larson, Edward takes Henry's so-called lucky trucks, and Henry goes out looking for them. However, after finding his lucky trucks, he breaks them. Similar to what I did with my season 10 list, I'm going to try and find some good points when I'm looking at these worst episodes because they weren't all bad, just there was room for improvement. So the good points in this episode is that I think the winter settings have really upped their game in this season. They're certainly the best settings that I've seen since the David Mitten era came to an end in season 7. They're nowhere near his standard, but they're better. And the image of Henry's face just popping up at the top of Gordon's Hill, and then just slides back down again. I have to admit, I did, and this is going to show my age, lol, when I saw that. It was nice to see Molly again, and having her paired up with James and pulling Rocky the breakdown crane, from a visual perspective, it was actually really pleasant to see. I like the red and yellow kind of colour schemes and Rocky having the mix of red and yellow as well was pleasing to the eye. I can understand why a lot of fandom have shipped Molly and James together because they do look like a good pairing. But it's the whole Lucky Trucks story that just drags this episode down for me. I know that this era of Henry is superstitious. I mean, after all, he's got a f***ing wishing tree going on. But for me, it is still a downgrade of his character. I thought that he was starting to do better in season 10, and it's just back to type. But I did have this originally much higher up in my list. I did a couple of rewatches of the episode, and I found it being better than I originally thought it was. Number 9, Thomas and the Lighthouse. Written by Abby Grant, Thomas neglects his instructions of taking a light bulb carefully to the lighthouse. The good point is that we got to see the Chinese dragon again. I know we just saw him in the previous season, but it's always nice to see the Chinese dragon. My main gripe about this is the light bulb itself. Why is it not packed more securely? You could put the light bulb in a box and then put it on a flatbed. Or put the light bulb in a box and put it in a truck. That has sides, which will give it more protection from breaking. The entire story is redundant. An even better way to guarantee the light bulb's safety? Get Edward or Toby to take it to the lighthouse. You have spent the entire hit era saying that Edward and Toby are old and slow. Keyword being slow. You don't even play to your own strengths that you set up from series 8 onwards. Instead, you have Thomas, one of the biggest bob eggs in the entire series, taking this. Of course it was going to break. Number 8. Dream On. Written by Neil Richards, Thomas wants to be shinier, faster, and stronger than Spencer. The good point is that Spencer does have a prominent role in this story at the start, and he is in character, 100%. He is a complete prick. But the story itself, it's just so generic. We've been down this road before. Everything that Thomas wants to be is just shallow. He wants to be shiny. He wants to be fast. He wants to be strong. 
Sadly, he's a tank engine. He's not going to be as strong as engines like Gordon and Spencer. One of the saving graces though is at least he kind of learns his lesson and gets to take the Duke of Boxford to the airport. It's not great, but a lot better than the stuff that's to come. Number 7. Thomas and the Stinky Cheese Written by Paul Larson, Thomas tries to avoid Diesel, Ari and Bert while taking some stinky cheese. My wife and my son Connor are going to hate me putting this in our worst episodes list because they love cheese. One of the key selling points of cheese is that sometimes the smellier is the better. And while we're on these little tangents, here's another one for you. Most of the Thomas fandom know this, but for the normies watching, did you know that this episode was originally a pilot for a CGI hybrid model series that was due to come in season 12? Sadly, it never made the final cut, but you can find images of it online, and some of them are absolutely terrifying. The way Diesel looks in particular is really creepy to me. Once again, the Steamies v Diesel's trope is used to its absolute bare minimum because it just centers around who's stinkier, Steamies or Diesel's, and they all wind up being covered in stinky cheese at the end, so it's redundant. It's not great, it's not the worst. You guessed it, this is my meh episode. Number 6, Thomas and the Big Bang. Written by Abby Grant, Thomas plays tricks on the narrow gauge engines at the wharf instead of doing his jobs. This was originally going to place lower on my list, but then I had to take a step back. Reason being is that this is also a story that I read to my kids a lot at bedtime when they were young, so I do have a little bit more fondness of it than I probably should. So I watched the episode twice, I tried to take the emotional attachment of it out of the equation, and I realised that the episode just isn't good. My main gripe is obviously Scarlet and Reneus. In classic series, they would never act like this, but this is who they are in this era, and it just grates me every time I see them like that. And if Sir Handel was meant to be the Scarlet of the narrow gauge engines in this era, he wouldn't take part in any of these shenanigans. He would have had his prank done to him, he would have been f and he would have told Master Percival, because the engines weren't getting their job done. It's not an entirely grating episode, but it's not a good one. Especially with, at the end, Thomas pulling a prank to show that the jobs had been done. Then everybody just laughs it off, going, Aha, you're such a funny engine. You're still a prick. Number 5, Thomas and the Spaceship. Written by Sharon Miller. Thomas and Percy are certain they've seen a spaceship in the sky. When really, it's just Jeremy. Even I could tell it was Jeremy. And that's with some of the lighting effects in this episode. I know it's meant to be nighttime so I know it's meant to be dull. But this was Game of Thrones season 8 style dull. I could barely see anything that was going on. I had to really, really crank up the brightness just to actually be able to see what the point of the story was. I think this insults me most because I am a sci-fi fan and I felt like this was just a slap in the face to all sci-fi fans out there. But I really did like the kind of theremin music that they did use for whenever the spaceship was potentially mentioned. So I've got to give props for that. But we all know what's wrong with these stories. They're generic and ironically, the moon looked like a bit of blue cheese. Number four, Don't Be Silly Billy. Written by Sharon Miller, a new orange engine named Billy ignores Thomas's advice and as a result, runs out of coal and water. You were probably expecting Don't Be Silly Billy to be higher up on my list. And in all honesty, I was expecting it too. But similar to Edward Strikes Out for season 10, there aren't any good points, but I was just so conflicted by it. I know that the character of Billy himself has had more love over the years, especially since Charlie got introduced from the Sharon Miller era onwards, and people really don't seem to like him, and he's got the same basis as Billy. And there's the whole thing about how Billy is seen as a comparison to how Thomas has grown over the years because Thomas in season 1 is a lot like how Billy is in season 11 but I personally don't see the comparisons. I think because I grew up in the classic era and I knew that Thomas back then was a prick but there was honest intentions about him however Billy just seemed to come off as just being a straight up prick. That being said though I actually kind of understand why Billy was acting the way he was in this episode. I get his frustration because how Thomas talks to Billy would get under my boiler as well. It would feel like Thomas is just 
belittling Billy and making him feel bad before Billy's even had a chance to prove himself. But Billy is very quick to anger and because he gets so angry so fast, he forgets everything that Thomas has told him. He forgets the order of the jobs, he forgets to take on coal and water. And I get that because when my mental health isn't in a good way, my short term and long term memory go flying out the window. I think I might need to do a bit more of a deep dive on this episode, but I personally think neither engine comes off good in this episode. Thomas is not a good boss, and Billy is not a good worker. But ironically, what really drags it down for me is the happy ending. I didn't like that everything got wrapped up in a nice little bowl by the time it was done. I wanted there to still be that conflict between them. Maybe by the end they understand why they act the way they act, but they're not on such an even keel. Maybe there's still that little bit of tension. Maybe Billy still thinks Thomas is bossy. And maybe Thomas still thinks Billy is not a good worker. Again, if you guys want it, I think I'm going to need to do a deep dive on this. I was just so conflicted by it. That's why I didn't go higher. Number three, Edward and the Mail. Written by Paul Larson, Edward has chosen to pull the mail, but does not know how to do the job, and is worried about asking other engines how to do it. This episode started so well. They were giving Edward lots of pats on the tender, saying that he was wise and he knew a lot, and that other engines could come to him for advice. That is Edward of the classic era. And then they did this episode and they completely f on him from a great height. For starters, even if Edward didn't know what to do about a job, he wouldn't be scared and not ask. He would ask what to do. It's the point of him being older and wiser. He does what younger ones wouldn't do. I would expect a Thomas or a Percy or even an Emily going, Oh, I'm not sure how to do this, but I don't want to look foolish, so I'm just going to give it my best shot. And then completely screwing it up. That's not Edward. They established it from the get-go, that he was older and wiser. If he didn't know what to do, he would go straight to Percy when he's being repaired and go, look, I know you're kind of getting repaired right now, but can you just give me the pointers of what to do for pulling the mail train so I don't make an arse of myself? The whole story is just a complete dumpster fire. I don't think any character in place of Edward would actually salvage it. Number two. Scarlowe storms through. Written by Neil Richards, Scarlowe faces all of his worst fears when Mr. Percival orders him to rescue some upset lambs during a thunderstorm. A good point. The CGI rain wasn't as jarring as it was previously. Aside from that, I f***ing hated this episode. Oh my god, the downgrade of Scarlowe just constantly gets under my skin. I know that they've started to portray Scarlowe as more childlike and prone to fear and impulsive, but they just seem to be getting worse and worse as the series goes on. Whoever told the writer of this episode that this is how Scarlowe should be, I would have went in, slapped the guy and said, go watch season four and you'll know what Scarlowe is meant to be like. This is a complete <laughs> of his character. Now I know a lot of the fans of my channel will say, Andrew, you actually defended Scarlowe being scared in your Season 7 review of The Old Bridge. And yes, I did. And yes, I stand by it. Because there was a difference here. Scarlowe and The Old Bridge had a near-death experience. He almost fell off a bridge and could have died. In this episode, Scarlowe's afraid of lightning and, 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 and I won't help the lammies. Give me a break. Yes, the moral of the story is to overcome your fears despite what they are. But Season 7 did it so much better. Season 11 makes the Season 7 episodes feel like Season 4 by comparison. Just god awful. But not as bad as the number one entry on this list, which is Toby's Triumph. Written by Abby Grant, Toby is chosen to take Alicia Botti to her concert, but he's worried that he'll mess up and does so too many times. When the only plus point that I can find is that Henrietta is in the episode, a character who has absolutely no lines and is treated like literal garbage, that just shows you how bad this episode is. This whole self-doubting Toby is so, so hard to watch. 
He's never taken a very special passenger before and that's why he's scared. I'm sorry, but classic Toby would not give a crap. He would just do what he was told and hope for the best. But most importantly, he would do the job well and he wouldn't worry about making any mistakes. Normally these episodes have a three strike formula, but I counted how many mistakes Toby made during this episode. He takes a bend too fast. He almost misses a signal. He doesn't acknowledge Percy or the children. He takes the wrong track. He doesn't notice a farmer warning him. He doesn't notice Elizabeth warning him and ends up landing in a muddy puddle. And it's all a result of this Toby worried trope. It doesn't improve the story. It doesn't create any conflict. It's just sad to watch. And I know this is a random point, but Alicia Botti no longer having an Italian accent. What the hell, man? Where's the continuity? This episode is called Toby's Triumph, but the episode itself is a complete and utter failure. So that's my top 10 worst episodes of Thomas and Friends season 11. What are your worst episodes of the series? Leave a comment below and let me know. Thanks for watching and until next time, keep on chugging.